Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Census Data Seminar. Uh, our topic today is Australia in the time of COVID-19. It certainly was in 2021 when we conducted Australia's 18th National Census. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Palawa people down in Tasmania. I'd like to um, acknowledge and express my respect for their it, we're custodians of a land here, here, past and present, and give a really special warm welcome to members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community that are joining us today. And yeah, acknowledge that this broadcast is going right across Australia today. So touching on lands of many different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, groups and nations. Um, my name's Duncan Young, and I'm the general manager of the Census Division in the ABS. And I'm joined today by uh, two of my colleagues, Mark Harding, the Program Manager of the Census Branch, and Caroline Deans, the Director of a 2021 Census Dissemination Project. And we're really looking forward to, to sharing some of the insights that we've recently released from a 2021 Census um, about Australia, and in particular, some of the things that we saw or, around COVID-19 a little bit of myth busting, a little bit of um, yeah, new insights and a little bit of some of the things which we expect to see, but uh, how clear it is coming through in our data. So uh, during this session, we'll have time at the end to answer your questions. And we'd love to have lots of questions from you today. So if you go to www.polev.com forward slash census COVID-19, you'll be able to submit your questions there and we'll get to those, those at the end of the session or as many as we can. You can put those questions in at any time. So a census was run and during the COVID, obviously, but it, and it made us pretty nervous. It built up, how is this census going to run? And people have got a lot on their plates at the moment. It's a bit hard for us to, to get our field force out out visiting people, how do we make sure the census is safe? safe. Um, so, to, but despite, I guess, our, our nervousness coming in, what we saw from a census was actually a very high quality result. So how do we measure the quality of a census? We look at the response rate. So what percentage of households that we've worked out were occupied on census night, responded to the census. That was over 96%, 96.1% of households. It's higher than our target and higher than we achieved in 2016. So that was a great result. We then go out after the census and we go back to 50,000 um, lucky households who get to do another ABS survey. And we go back to their households to ask everyone in each of those households where they, they might have been on census night or where they think they were on census night. And we then sort of compare the results from that with what we saw in the census. And by comparing those results, we can work out how many people did we miss in the census or how many people did we count more than once. And the census had a net undercount of only 0.7%. So that means that the census counts are less than 1% lower than what uh, there were people in Australia on census night. That's the lowest net undercount we've ever seen in a census. So definitely another bit of a stamp of approval on the census. Um, final or element of quality for us is what we've seen over multiple censuses is that as people fill out the census online, we get higher quality data. The online form's a little bit smarter than the old paper version. It takes you to the right questions. It, it tells you what person the question's about rather than person one, person two, person three. And what we see is that people are uh, more confident when they fill out, out the online form. They'll leave less questions blank than, than on paper. And so that gives us a higher quality result overall. And so we're really pleased that four out of every five Australians participated online in 2021. What about the, the COVID context of, of 2021? So, Joe, let's cast our mind back to, to 2021, not to, to give any of us sort of a post-traumatic lockdown disorder, but, but in August 2021, we had lockdowns in Sydney, the um, lockdowns from Census Night in Melbourne and um, and 
overall during the census collection period, about half of the country were in lockdown or experiencing restrictions at some point in time. We also had, had different differing sort of border kind of conditions and controls, so limiting people moving in and out of a country, but also in and out of um, particular states in the country. But the data we've released in second release, though, also has some other important time points. We ask them second release. We ask him a census um, about people's address one year ago and five years ago in order to understand people's internal migration or internal movement in the country. And so August 2020 was also a time that was affected by, by COVID and COVID restrictions in Australia. Um, going back five years, though, to, to August um, 2016 is clearly a time point before the pandemic. So our five-year-ago addresses reflect a picture before the pandemic. Now, when we look at the data uh, from the 2021 census, we always compare data from a census to previous censuses, and in particular to the census before, so 9th of August 2016. And so uh, when we think about that five years in between, clearly the, the pandemic had a big impact in 2020 and 2021. But uh, in fact, during the five years, it's probably three and a half years is where the country wasn't impacted by COVID. And then the last year and a half, where the population was impacted by COVID. So as you'll see, as we step through some of the data later on, some of the, the slowing down or the changing of things in the COVID period is actually sometimes outweighed by the, the activity that occurred in the first three and a half years. So that's sort of an important contextual kind of piece. Um, but uh, looking at the data from the 2021 census, uh, Take, you, we need to take a little bit of, of care and, and have a bit of understanding of the data that's presented there. It's, our first view is that we are really be, um, feel quite fortunate that we are able to get out and collect data in 2021. We think it was a, it obviously be quite a unique period in Australia's history and I think that we'll always be um, highly valuing of this kind of snapshot that we got during in the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, there are some answers and some responses to the questions, which if we'd asked around the census um, now, you'd probably get different answers from what I'd, we got in August last year. And so some of the things that we encourage you to do when you're using the census data from 2021 is to look at the trends over time. So look at what was in 2011, 2016, 2021, and that can help you see what's been an ongoing trend versus something a bit different in 2021. Also look at comparisons between different states or different areas within states, because some areas were in lockdown, some weren't in lockdowns. And so that can help tell a bit of a picture. But then ultimately, when we're looking at the 2021 census data, then trying to work out, well, what's the world going to be like in 2023 or 2024? I think, I think for it, there's obviously always uncertainty with the future. And I think think how we, what the new normal looks like past COVID-19. None of us really know exactly what that, that will look like. And so to having another data point, having another bit of information is really important to, to inform that. We, we don't think the world will turn back to what it was in 2016. Um, so to, it's about taking this data and sort of looking forward from here. Now I'm going to sort of um, highlight a couple of different areas. There's where we expected to see some things in the uh, 2021 census. And so one of the, one of the things that people all had talked quite a bit about was, well, people are going to start moving in, in because of COVID. They'll move away from areas of lockdown. They have greater flexibility in how they work now, working remotely. And so you know, surely everyone will end up yeah, living on the coast, moving to the sun and the the like and what what we see in this chart in front of us here is that the net number of people that have moved to SA4s in the year before census. So in the last twelve months, if we look at each area of a country and we t consider how many people have moved in and how many people have moved away, what are the areas with the greatest growth? And so that, these are the ten areas around the country with greatest growth. And these are SA4s. That's a um. It, 
it's a statistical area for, but it's just a, a way that we try and break down geographies around the country so that you can compare them over time. Because what we find is that the border lines for suburbs and for councils and stuff, they do change over time. So comparing them can be a bit tricky, but we know that with SA4s, we can do like for like comparison. And so Australia is broken down into 88 SA4s. And so in the top 10 here, well, you can see there is a bit of a, a sun kind of theme with Gold Coast having the biggest number of net number of people moving in at the top of the list. 9,000 people um, lived in a different area at the year before and 9,000 more lived in the Gold Coast the year after when we take away all the people who moved away, it was 9,000 more. Sunshine Coast in second, Wide Bay in fourth, Moreton Bay in north, Logan Bow Desert. So quite a um, strong presence there, there of sort of a southeast Queensland and sort of sunny kind of territory there. The exceptions there are the ACT in third place, probably doesn't quite classify as a, as a beach sun destination. Um, Geelong down at, down at seventh, and then three in New South Wales. So um, did they all move to, to escape COVID and get to the sun? Well, some of them would certainly have done so, too, and certainly would have been a, a reason for a move. But if we look back over time um, to uh, 2016 and 2011, and we're just looking at Gold Coast here. So they were one on the top of the list there. We saw on the last slide, 9,000 um, net arrivals. And so on the right-hand side there, you can see 2021, 9,024 net arrivals. And the arrivals are in the teal kind of colour. The departures are in sort of the orangey red colour. And there's 9,000 more arrivals and departures. So when we look back at the last two censuses, we've seen in the Gold Coast as a net, a net um, having high net arrival numbers, being a, a destination location in the country. And we've seen it sort of increasing, 3,000 in 2011, 6,000 in 2016, 9,000 in 2021. So to, uh, in some ways, as we would have expected this to happen anyway, even without COVID. But um, it was, obviously, it has jumped up again. It's jumped up, up another 2,700 in the last year. So to, uh, let's, let's have a little bit more of a, a dig into this. But where are people coming from um, um, in the, the previous location from a year ago? And so to, one of the things that we always see in the census is that uh, most people who move don't actually move that far. There's a lot of people who the primary location people move is actually into the same SA4 that they're already living. This, this picture doesn't show that. This picture breaks it down by the, the states in the country. And so what? So on the, you can see in each of these pictures, again, it's that close to home. The grey is the rest of Queensland. So people moving, say, from Brisbane to the Gold Coast would be in that grey kind of area. And so the majority of the people moving to the Gold Coast in all three censuses are from the, the rest of Queensland, followed by New South Wales, our largest state, followed by Victoria after that. But what we can see here, for, um, as you look closely, at it, is a bit of a shift in that 2016 picture. So in the 2016 picture, we can see a, the, the rest of Queensland as a proportion has dropped compared to um, previous times. It was, it's like nearly 50%, 48% in 2011. By 2021, that's dropped down to 43%. So it's got a smaller share of a tile for the pie there. What we can see is that actually New South Wales and Victoria have grown as a share of a pie there. So and Victoria is probably one of the more noticeable ones. We have a growth from 10% in 2011, 10% in 2016, to 16% in 2021. So Joe, there could be a little bit of a, a COVID migration factor there Ed, in that picture. Um, the other one that we can see there, Ed, it's a little bit harder to see, but it's the, the red Ed, wedge at about uh, 11 o'clock, uh, top left of a picture there. That's Western Australia. And what we actually saw there was that the number of people moving from Western Australia to the Gold Coast uh, in the census year halved in 2021. So uh, it wasn't sort of expansion everywhere. There was a, a real contraction there.
Next up, we're going to look at um, workers in food services Australia. So um, this is looking at the number of employees, count of employees in cafe and restaurants, takeaway food services and catering services. So obviously the um, restrictions and lockdowns have affected the way or did affect the way we were eating, dining out, out going to places. And so do, would we expect to see a big drop off in the number of people working in cafes and restaurants? Would we expect to see a massive growth in, in takeaway food services? So what we can see here between 2016 and 2021 at a national level is a, a growth, of, a, a reasonable growth of in cafes and restaurants a more significant growth in takeaway food services and a slight decline in catering in services in terms of the total number of employees between both censuses. Now, if we step into the next picture vote, we break down this by a few of our capital cities across the country. And here we can see that actually the trends aren't consistent across the country. So uh, if we look at Sydney, you can see that the number of people working in cafes and restaurants has had a, a significant decline um, between in 2016 and 2021. We've also can see that in terms of catering services, a significant decline. If we travel, travel west from Sydney, maybe drive across to Adelaide, what you can see there is that there's actually been a a growth from a number of people working in cafes and restaurants and a growth from a number of people working in, in catering services. And then if we go to Perth City, you get a different story again. You see a, those two areas staying about consistent, but a growth in takeaway food services. But what we did see between the censuses is that at um, Perth, didn't grow as much as a city over the last five years compared to what it had in sort of previous five-year periods. So that might have tampered down some of the growth in cafes and restaurants, despite the fact that there was um, not lockdowns in place in the country. Rightio. So let's, um, let's talk now about how Australia's connection with the world changed during COVID-19. And I'll hand over to Mark Harding to take us through this section. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, yeah, the, the COVID certainly did uh, affect our connection with the world in Australia, and the census picks up a few um, key variables around that. But before I get into that, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're all meeting on. And for me here in Sydney, that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, so moving straight into the information, uh, we are going to be talking about overseas visitors. We'll be talking about Australians who lived overseas in 2020, uh, people migrating to Australia over the last five years. And I'll also touch on some related occupations around uh, you know, industries in, in relation to uh, tourism and such things, just because that's interesting. And it's interesting to see what, what uh, impacts COVID has had there. So uh, first up, we have a chart that shows the number of people with a usual residence in Australia at census time uh, who reported that they're they were living overseas one year before the census. Uh, the peach bar there uh, across all the states uh, represents the 2021 census, and you can compare that to the 2016 census in the red and the 2011 census in the teal. So. Um, Obviously, people had to be residing in Australia at the time of the census to be counted in the census. So this is really showing who was out of the country and living out of the country a year before and then living in the, in the country uh, at, um, at census time. So as expected, these numbers are much smaller than previous census cycles. No great COVID surprise there, but certainly the story we did expect to see. And at the Australia level, what that looks like is there were um, over 300,000 people living overseas the year before the 2011 census, and that jumped up to to, um, to about 400,000 people in the 2016 census, but then it really decreased uh, right down to 175,000 people in the 2021 census. So August uh, 2020 was only really several months into the pandemic and there were limited flights. There were caps on people coming to Australia. There was mandatory quarantine in place for those who were given the exemption to travel. And these restrictions really didn't start easing until after the census in November in 2021 in New South Wales and Victoria. And, and 
other states eased over the next few months. So most states show at least a halving in the numbers uh, who were overseas in the previous year. Uh, TAS and Queensland are slightly less than half. And Victoria was the most affected with the numbers shrinking down from 115,000 in 2016 to only 44,000 in 2021. But we can go deeper with the census data and we can look at what's driving that change a bit. We're able to look at different characteristics that we also collect on the census uh, and look at those characteristics of certain populations. And in this case, the population of people who were living overseas the year before the census. So in particular here, we're looking at the citizenship of those people. And it does tell an interesting story. Uh, of those 312,000 people counted in the 2011 census, just over one in four were Australian citizens. And of the 400,000 that I mentioned in the 2016 census, it was closer to one in five, as you can see from the middle of your screen there, um, comparing the, the, the teal, which is Australian uh, citizens, and the red, which is not Australian citizens. Uh, and so once you get to 2021, it's quite a different story. There were nearly equal numbers of Australian citizens and non-citizens in terms of that population of people who lived overseas one year prior to the census. Now, as you can see from that, those numbers on the right, it's not really because more Australians were returning home, more Australian citizens were returning home. Uh, it's actually the, the migrant uh, that, that aren't coming to Australia in that period that, um, that really changed that, um, that ratio, that relationship. So in, in spite of travel restrictions, the limited flights, the quarantining and the other hurdles that were in place, Australia, Australian citizens still returned home in as great a number as they did in what we saw in 2016 and um, pretty much in 2011 as well. That is maybe a bit of a surprise, but clearly people were motivated through COVID to return to Australia you know, at that time uh, for, for their own reasons. Um, the census also does collect data uh, on where people lived five years ago. And from that, uh, just having a look, it's not on your screen, but I uh, could see that around 250,000 Australian citizens returned home in the last five years compared to around 230,000 in the five years prior. And while that's not a huge difference, uh, as Duncan was outlining, it does include that more, you know, those more than three years of the period between censuses where COVID wasn't in effect. Um, so we wouldn't expect to see uh, necessarily a radical difference, but it did did increase in terms of how many people returned uh, over that time. So let's move on a bit since we've identified that the migrant story is an interesting one and take a bit of a look uh, at that, uh, which is it's clearly another way to look at our interactions with the rest of the world in terms of the migrants and people moving to Australia. And it's a very important one for Australia. This chart shows the number of people who migrated to Australia since 2016. We have a year of arrival variable in the census that, that allows us to look at who was arriving over that time. Uh, and uh, the teal bar there shows bars, the four teal bars show the pre-pandemic years and the orange is the, the last two years, noting that 2021 is uh, people who arrived in Australia up until census night, which was the 10th of August, so not a full year there. So since 2016, if you added up all those teal bars, you'd see that over 1.2 million people uh, sorry, over all of the bars, over 1.2 million people migrated to Australia with 1.1 million of those in the teal bars in 2016, 17, 18 and 19. In 2020, we had less than 130,000 people immigrating uh, to Australia and then less than 40,000 in the seven and a bit months in the lead up to the census in 2021. So delving into that a bit deeper, um, we can look at the characteristics uh, of um, people uh, who, who were migrating in in those years. And we can also uh, see that in the full period, nearly one in five recent arrivals came from India and it was more like one in 10 from uh, China. In 2021, the largest group who were born in New Zealand in 2021 represented 13% of all arrivals that year. Uh, and that was compared to only 4% over the five-year period. So a lot more New Zealanders coming in during the, um, the pandemic period, if you will, than we saw over the whole period between censuses. Another thing that we do have on the census uh, we can look at is uh, tourists and who was visiting our country, overseas tourists. So we'll have a 
bit of a look at that now. Uh, what we call what we have in our data is what we call our place of enumeration data in the census, and that's essentially viewing the data by where we counted people rather than where we usually where they usually live, which is our usual resident data, and that's something that we share most of our data by. But when we look at where we counted people, this will include people who don't usually live in Australia, and therefore the overseas visitors who were there at the time are included in the data. Now, there's no real surprises here again. Uh, looking at the peach colour across all the states, uh, we can see a big reduction in the number of overseas visitors uh, through you know, caught in the census. Uh, and that's so uh, that's right on August 10, 2021. And just over 60,000 people uh, re make up that. And it's only one fifth of the number of people in Australia, overseas visitors in Australia that we counted in 2016 uh, with uh, 315 and a half thousand people that we counted then. So the biggest reductions there, as you can see, uh, New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, which are also the three states with historically the most overseas visitors. And the bars are a lot smaller um, on this chart up the end where TAS, NT, ACT, so whether you can see those, I'm not sure, but it, uh, TAS and NT were affected to a slightly lesser extent. Uh, so um, maybe not a surprise in terms of where people were going while they were in Australia and visiting from overseas. So moving on, I did say we'd take a quick uh, diversion into um, occupation data. And, and so in addition to borders being closed uh, to overseas visitors, there were border restrictions in place within Australia as well, affecting domestic tourism. And we thought this quick detour into the census data on employment across some of the uh, related occupations would be interesting. A benefit of census is that it allows data to be um, analysed at finer levels. And here we have four-digit uh, occupations in what we what's called the ANSCO classification, which is our standard classification for occupations, and that includes people working in these tourism areas. So on the left there is tourism and travel advisors, which has uh, fallen from employing more than 20,000 people in 2011 and in 20, 2016 to just employing over 10,000 in 2021. Uh, also affected are uh, travel attendants, uh, which includes flight attendants, and this occupation fell by nearly 30% between 2016 and 2021. Similarly, uh, we saw about a 30% fall in the gallery, museum, and tour guides occupations, and uh, affected to a slightly less uh, extent are uh, ticket salespeople, dropped by about 20%. And the drop here was mostly, uh, when we look at this and break this down at even finer codes, it's most, mostly in the occupation that we call ticket sellers, uh, and that covers people who make reservations for services such as travel and also admission to sporting and entertainment venues. So um, clearly an effect there. Uh, we can look at this a little bit closer by state and see a couple of different stories. So um, we see that the number of people employed as tourism and travel advisors uh, decreased in all states, uh, but the numbers more than halved in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, South Australia, WA, ACT, and they nearly halved in the NT. Uh, but TAS had the smallest decrease, but it wasn't that small. It was still down by almost 40%. Bit of a different story then, if we do look at the gallery, museum, and tour guide. So we see uh, that the number of employees certainly decreased in New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland. But we can see it was also a small decrease in WA and only slight falls in the other states. Uh, sorry, there was a small increase in WA and only a slight fall in the other states. So a clearly a difference across the states and a very different environment, COVID environment at the time across the states. So um, some interesting stories there. And there are more interesting occupation stories, but I'm going to hand over to Caroline now. She'll continue talking a bit about that and also some other uh, things that we found in the data. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much, Mark. And I'm going to now talk a little bit more, continue that theme on employment, so talking about our working patterns and in particular how we how we got to got to work. And then about some of the other activities that the census captures that we get part participate in, like looking after children and volunteering and, and doing some housework. So that's going to be the focus of what I'm going to go through. But before I start on that, I do want to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I am presenting from today, and that's the Turrbal people um, up in up in Brisbane. And of course, extend my uh, respect to um, elders right throughout the country, wherever you are dialing in from today. So I'm going to, I think we've already seen that a lot of the results that we have captured in this 
year census as are expected, but some are also surprising. So hopefully we'll continue on that theme of identifying some expected results and maybe throw in some more surprises. So when I look at how people are getting to work, we have to remember, it has to be very clear that we're talking about the point in time that we uh, conducted the census, which was the 10th of August last year. And Duncan started with uh, that nice reminder of what we were all doing back then and the fact that a lot of the country was in fact in lockdown and people were perhaps less able to go to work. And so what the data from the census shows is that snapshot of the 10th of August last year. And in terms of our working patterns, and going to work has that has that changed since then? And we won't we won't know for sure. I think we'll see that our working patterns have reverted to uh, a pre-COVID level to some extent, but it's certainly and uh, not not back to the levels we we had. I think we've all enjoyed that um, freedom of working from from home and removing the commute from from our days. So to measure how our future. Um, working patterns evolve, we really need other data sources and the next census, of course, to tell us that. But it be interesting to keep an eye on things like uh, tolls uh, that people are using in different cities and, and the bus and the metro systems and to just see, well, how, how have we bounced back from COVID? Are we bouncing back? But I will d just say that to set the scene and take you first to what we did see back in August last year and looking at traveling to work. Now, probably not a huge surprise here. I don't think if we look at that middle part of that chart, where we're looking at the proportion of people who are employed who actually worked at home on census day. So 21%, one in five of the uh, employed population actually worked at home on census day. And that's about a fourfold increase on what we've seen in previous census cycles. And so I think we, we all probably expected to see that in the in the data. What I found surprising in the data was if we you look to the left of the chart there, the number of people who did actually travel to work still, who did do that commute. And two in three employed people still travel to work on census day last year. Now, that's that's certainly a fall on previous years where it's been 84 or 85%, but still two, two and three people did go to work. And we've got at the right of the screen there, a slight increase in the uh, proportion of people who did, did not go to work at all. So let's zoom in a little bit on how people who travel to work, the, the method they took and break that down a little bit more. And what I've done on this chart here is I've switched the axes to actually reflect the number of people, not just the proportion of employed people, but the number of people. And what I found really striking in this data is if you look on the left, um, that's the number of people who drove to work on census day last year. And that is showing in the peach 6.4 million people around the country drove to work on census day last year. That's only just down on the 6.6 .6 million that we saw in the 2016 census. So still a lot of cars on, on the road. And moving across to the right of that chart a bit more, that work from home number, I showed you the proportion in the previous chart. Now looking at the number, that's 2.5 million people worked at home. And then the number who did not go to work was about one and a half million. And I'm going to zoom in on the other modes of transport in a moment because they're a little bit too small to see on this chart here. But first, let's have a think about the worked at home population and just see if there were any differences across the country. And we probably all expect that there were considerable differences as we've already seen in the data that both Mark and Duncan have, have presented. So now we're just looking at the proportion of uh, people, the employed people who work from home in various regions across the country and we're keeping it at a fairly high level, but we're looking at the greater capital city area and then the rest of the state. So on the left of the chart there is Greater Sydney, the, the next uh, block 
down is the rest of New South Wales. Then we've got the Greater Melbourne area, rest of Victoria, Greater Brisbane, rest of Queensland, and so on across across all the states. And um, these are all in percentages. And you can see that the experiences of people working from home very different in the Sydney and Melbourne than in some of the the other states. So in Sydney, that's nearly 40% of people in 2021 worked from home in the greater Sydney area. And in Melbourne, it's just under 30%. Those bars to the left, which are really dwarfed by the peach bars, are showing the 2011 and the 2016 experiences. And in Sydney, It was around 4% of people who worked from home in 2011 and 2016, jumping up to nearly 40%, so nearly 10 times the the rate of people worked at at home and not quite as large jump in Melbourne, but still a very large jump. And in Brisbane, you can see a, a big increase as well. And in the regional parts of those states, they are still far below the rates of people um, in Greater Sydney and Greater Melbourne, but uh, you can see in the rest of New South Wales and rest of Victoria, about 15% of the um, employed population were working from home, which is up from a, just over 5% in the previous two census cycles. And if we move across to states that were perhaps less affected by COVID restrictions, and you can see that we did still see uh, quite a change in work from home patterns, even in places where people weren't experiencing lockdown. So, for example, in Greater Adelaide, there wasn't a lockdown at the time of the census. There had been in the month prior, but at the time of the census, there there wasn't. Uh, Perth, same situation, Hobart and so on. But you can see quite a large increase in the proportion of people in those other other regions who were also taking advantage of the opportunity to work, work from home. And having a look at the public transport use now. So I've taken this out of the other slide because the number of people using public transport is actually quite a bit, quite a bit less than those who are, who are driving their cars. So this really gives us a bit of a zoom in on how public transport use has changed over the last three census cycles. And again, presenting this at an Australia level and looking at the number of people using the different modes of transport. So overall, um, we saw more than halving of the number of people who used public transport across across Australia. You can see that across all the different modes. So train continues to be the form of public transport that most people use, about 300,000 quarter train on census day, uh, which is it's not quite a third, but it's a, certainly a very large fall on uh, the previous uh, census period in 2016. Also a big fall on on bus and trams and all the other modes of tra- public transport really, really were affected as, as well. T- to have a look at how different regions um, that probably had very different experiences of travelling to work before COVID um, responded to COVID. I'm going to zoom in on two two extremes. Um, So I'm going to have a look at Sydney first, and this is the Sydney inner city area. And then I'm going to look at a very different capital city in that that is Darwin. And here we're just looking at two two time points. uh, That is the 2016 census and the 2021 census. So let's look first at 2016. And these are people who have a workplace in the inner city. So these aren't the people who live in the city, but another thing that we do in the census is we capture the place of work. So we can do analysis by where the the workplace is. And so people who had a workplace in the Sydney inner city, back in 2016, 60% of them use public transport to get in to work, which probably makes a lot of sense because I think the roads are, you know, fairly crowded. Finding a car park is impossible and probably costs costs a small fortune. So most people are on the bus or on the train in, to get into their offices and other workplaces in Sydney. And there were still a number, 20% who, who drove in and then an active form of transport, like they rode their bikes or they walked and 
interestingly, a very small number that that worked from home back in 2016. Now we we change change to 2021, and as you can see, more than 60% of people who've who've got a workplace in Sydney in a city actually work from home. There were very few people on the on the bus or the train that fell to ten percent, and the the number of people driving also fell, and the active transport fell. So just complete switch in that five year period for people in in Sydney in a in a city, but heading up up north to Darwin and looking first at what the experience was back in 2016, again, looking at the dark orange bar. And for people who had a workplace in the Darwin City area, almost all of them, three quarters of them, um, drove a car or travelled in a car to to work in 2016. Very few uh, were on public transport. There were a few more using active forms of transport and a very small number working at home. In fact, that number working at home in Darwin City in 2016 was 1.6%. And when we move forward to 2021, the patterns don't change all that much. So where we saw the Sydney really flip um, the ways people travel to work, we can see that about the same proportion of people drove a slight fall in public transport, tiny fall in active transport. And yes, we did see an increase in work from home, but that increased to 4.2% of of the population. Uh, so looking at the numbers, in fact, for the work from home of people in, in the Darwin city um, region, in 2016, there were only 431 people who had a workplace in Darwin that actually worked at home on census day. And that increased to just over 1,200 people, but still very small numbers of people working at home when they've got a workplace in Darwin City. Now I'm going to change the focus a little bit and have a look at the perennial favourite topic of who does the housework or how much housework are we doing, our time spent on domestic duties, because maybe we thought that if we were spending more time at home, we had the opportunity to maybe do a little bit more more tidying up around the, and around the house. And that's in fact what we, what we found. So here I'm just looking at the uh, 2021 data for comparing people who worked at home on Census Day to those who travelled to work on Census Day. And the teal shades here uh, represent the re not many hours of housework that were done. So the light teal there is did zero hours in the week before census and then the darker teal is less than less than five. So when you look at those who travel to work, more than half um, either did well, zero or less than, than five hours. But when we look at the peach colours there, they're representing slightly more hours a week spent on the domestic duties. And that light peach is five to 14 hours during during the week, moving up to 15 to 29. And then those people uh, in that dark orange pie there that were doing more than 30 hours. So when we have a look at it, we can see that on the left, those who worked at home, they certainly were... Um, people who spent more time are on their on their housework, and maybe you know one of the benefits when you when you work from home is you've got time to put on put on a load of washing or maybe get up and have a break from the the screen and and, and do some vacuuming, and as this chart suggests, we we were taking advantage of that that time at home to to do more of those those domestic duties compared to those who travelled to work who did a little bit less. And changing to another piece of data that we collect on the census, really important piece of information about volunteering. And when we look at volunteering on the census, another way we may choose to spend our time is volunteering with an organisation or, or a group. And we ask about volunteering for the 12 months prior to, to the census. And because of all the restrictions uh, that we see, saw around the, the year before the census, it's probably not a surprise at all that the rates of volunteering did decrease. 
at the national level in 2016, we found that about one in five people did report that they had done some volunteering in the year before the census, and that dropped down to one in seven in the year before the, the 2021 census. And there is a bit of a difference. They did fall across all the different jurisdictions that we, that we see on the chart there, but it has fallen most markedly in New South Wales and then to a lesser extent in, in Victoria. Uh, but what we can also see is that the highest rate of volunteering is still in the ACT. That's fallen off as well, but um, the people in the ACT are more likely to volunteer than people in other, other states and territories. And the final piece of data I'm going to look at is another uh, related one about caring for kids. Uh, so that we ask questions about providing child care or providing care to your own child, but also um, other people's children, or whether you provide some care to both your own and other people's children. Looking at the Australia level to start with, and the proportion of people who um, didn't provide any child care in the week before the census increased a little bit. Those who cared for their own children, well, that stayed about the same. One in five people reported that they spent some time caring for their own children. And then the, the bar here that is probably of most interest that I am going to zoom in on is those who provided care for other ch another child or, or other, other children. Uh, so let's have a look at that across the different capital cities. And again, um, it's quite obvious, I think, when you, you think about the data that this, this has happened, but maybe not, not something that we've given a great deal of thought to when we're thinking about the, the impact of, of COVID on how we're, we're living our lives. But we can see there that the proportion of people who cared for other people's children in the week before the census has really fallen quite sharply in Sydney and to a lesser extent in Melbourne and Brisbane, and really fallen in a lot of the, a lot of the capital cities, with the exceptions of Perth and Darwin that uh, went up a little bit. And if we cast our minds back to what was happening in August 2021, people living in Sydney and in Melbourne were experiencing those lockdowns and there were restrictions on how often you could leave your house or how far you could you could travel. And so there was less less chance for uh, relatives to to look after um, their maybe their their nieces and nephews or their their grandchildren. And another element that would be contributing to this is um, that it, it was before a lot of the population had received vaccination. It seems like a very long time ago now, but the vaccination program only rolled out at the start of about February, March in 2021. So when we got to August, there's still quite a few people that didn't have the opportunity to get the vaccine. I think I remember certainly in in my own life seeing that there was protection of the more vulnerable people. And so grand grandparents not always getting that chance to to look after their 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 grandkids. And I think that's what we're we're seeing on this this chart here and uh, the, the difference in the other states like Perth or the cities like Perth where people uh, could still spend uh, time and care for their, their um, other people's children. So that's been a very whirlwind um, look through a very uh, broad array of data that we collect in the census. Um, we haven't touched on all topics, so I'm going to put up a slide now that does just show you the breadth of information that is collected in the census. And most of it is now available. Um, so our first release came out back in June and then our second release of data came out last week. And you can 
get on our website now and help yourself to this data and look for any of the, the patterns that you might be interested in seeing for yourself. You might want to know for your local area uh, what were some of the experiences with changes in, in occupations or where people have moved moved to. You might be interested in the volunteering story that I had a look at or um, maybe caring for caring for kids. So I would encourage you to get onto the website, the ABS website, because we make it quite easy for you to find census data. We've got um, a lot of census data that we do pre, pre-package and um, on the census homepage, uh, there's links that either find census data by your area or by topic. And area allows you to type in um, your, your suburb or maybe your local government area or, or any other area you might be interested in and download some, some data about that area to see what the census results were showing in your area. Or if you're interested in looking at data by, by topic, then we've prepackaged some information there for you, for you too. And I always do like to promote the census dictionary if you're struggling with any of the concepts that um, are covered by the the data that you're seeing from the census. We have a really comprehensive dictionary that has information on every single variable and defines the the variable, talks about the scope, um, you know, the population that answered the question or is included in that in that data. It also talks about um, data use considerations, how the question might have changed over time. So I certainly encourage you to have a look at the census dictionary to um, help understand the the data that is available to you. And I don't have a slide to show this, but of course, Table Builder is now available with both first and second release data items. So for those who who want to play with the data themselves and not just use the pre-packaged um, material that we've provided, get into Table Builder and you can start constructing your own tables and drill into the data in to, yeah, to your heart's content. We have got some more analysis that we'll be presenting over the coming weeks and a couple of months. And we've got a number of articles uh, that are coming out. So these are these are articles where we've really had a deep look into various topics and are presenting a lot of data and case studies on, on topics. And associated with each of these articles that are being released will be seminars like, like this one with a real focus next on a journey to work, uh, more about migration within Australia, employment in the workforce in Australia, and then a really interesting one on service in the Australian Defence Force. So I'd encourage you, if you want to find out more about the census or want to hear us tell you more about the census, uh, please register for these seminars at that events page on the ABS website or keep an eye out on our website as well for when the articles are released because there are some really fascinating stories within, within these articles. So I'm going to wrap that up now and I'm going to hand over to Nicole who is going to facilitate our questions and a reminder that if you do have any questions, there is the uh, address on your screen where you can submit the questions. It's pollev.com forward slash census COVID-19. So I'll pass over to Nicole to uh, start fielding those questions. Lovely. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Our first question is for Duncan today. Looking at internal migration within Australia, we have the number of people moving uh, to new locations. Do you have those numbers available by occupation or industry? Yeah, absolutely. Um, For uh, Caroline mentioned our Table Builder product. And yet, if using the Table Builder product, you can do the breakdown by um, industry or occupation, and you can do that at different levels of detail. So Mark mentioned earlier, um, our occupations are broken up by in a classification called ANSCO. It's a hierarchical classification. So you can go at the most detailed level where it breaks it down into something like 
11, 1200 occupations, or you can actually move it up a level and sort of see like occupations with um, yeah, similarities to each other in terms of uh, the skills and training required to get those occupations sort of grouped together. So all of the professional occupations together, or all of the technical trade occupations together. But yeah, absolutely, you can look at that. Um, you can also see the, the number of people which are in the the labour market versus not in the labour market that are moving into locations. So some of the move, movement we see is retirees, some of it we see is students, and so you can sort of see all of that breakdown. Right. Uh, and now looking at international migration, Mark, do you think that migration data will bounce back to pre-COVID levels? Oh, that's a that's a speculation that we're, we're all wondering, I think. Uh, so we, we are very... We're excited about the census data um, and taking it in COVID because we get that real, you know, photograph, if you will, of the nation at a really interesting time in history. But in some ways, even more excited to then take another census afterwards and really be able to see that new normal and the change. Uh, so I'm deliberately not answering the question here, if you've if you've noticed, which is to say that what I think, uh, <laughs> what I speculate on, isn't really um, the 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 story here because. Uh, I don't. Ha I'm not an expert on this any more than anyone else, but I am really interested to see what the next census shows, and uh, and to you know we'll, we'll all be uh, in the in the picture as we get closer to that census about well, how has the world gone and what are we expecting to see. But it'll be really interesting to be able to put this census in context in some of those areas that were really COVID affected at the time, such as international visitors. So there's my non-answer to that question, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Just adding a little bit, Mark, to there too. Obviously, the ABS also has a range of other products available through our website. So we um, we do publish data on our population and our international migration in between censuses using um, data that we work with the Department of Home Affairs on, based on on aircraft arrivals, boat arrivals and the like. And so, um, yeah, Ted, I'd look there first. You'll get a, a bit more of an up-to-date kind of picture of how our migration's changing. And then, yeah, Ted, as Mark says, the 2026 census will be the, the time that we get that really rich, deep data about migration and all of the characteristics that we can add to it. Uh, Caroline, a question for you. What was the correlation between personal income and people working from home? And did it vary a lot between different geographies, especially capital cities versus regional areas? Well, what we find, and I'll, I'll say I didn't look at that particular data. We looked, played with a lot of data to come up with these, these stories. What we do find is that income is very variable across um, regions anyway. So in capital cities compared to regional areas, you'll usually find that the personal income is is higher to start with before you even add in that dimension of, of working from home. But I think what that question is getting to is what are the who are the types of people who are working from home? Because I did say that two and three people did still still go to to work and that uh, number was varied across the, the country. And so some occupations really lend themselves well to working at home. And some of those occupations may be the higher, higher paid occupations. So certainly professionals, many professionals are able to work from from home. A lot of the office workers and managers have got the ability to work from home. But for those customer facing or frontline staff, um, they don't have that opportunity to work from home because they need to go into the hospital to deliver the nursing services or the aged care services. So I think when we're looking at that question of whether income varies about, according to uh, working from home or not working from home, it's really getting into what are the occupations that are able to work from home. And it's probably no surprise to to anyone when we did look at the top uh, number of occupations, uh, the, sorry, the, the top occupations with the greatest proportion of people working from home, I think about the top four or five are all in the, the IT um, related jobs. Um, so I think IT professionals have been 
able to work from home for some time. They've got their technology enabled in their own own homes. So we, we saw rates of uh, over eighty percent of people in that those sort of occupations working from home. So I think Nicole, that was a bit of a non-answer as well, but pointing people to have a look at occupation data um, as something more relevant, perhaps, to the the income picture that we might have observed. Luckily, um, Caroline's non-answer, uh, which I thought was actually a very good answer, um, bought me enough time to have a quick look in, in Table Builder. And um, it's an interesting question. Like, for, So people who worked at home, uh, one in every four of the people who worked at home um, earned over $2,000 per week. So we're in one of our top three income ranges. Um, but if we look at public transport or people who took a vehicle to work, it's one in six were in the 2000 plus. So there certainly is at that higher income and earning end. Um, yeah, there's a, people working at home are more likely to be represented in that high income earning groups. Great. Uh, while you've got the floor, Duncan, we've got another one for you here. Uh, it's very interesting to see the different impacts on the cafe and restaurant workforce across Sydney, Adelaide and Perth. How would this data be used given it shows a unique snapshot? Yeah, it's a, our data is used in a lot of different ways. So to, our data, I guess our first kind of thought with our data it always goes to government and to um, policy makers and how they um, might design policy. So to, if they're looking at um, get industries which are performing well, providing employment, um, at whether or not they've got um, it, enough people with the right qualifications to work in those industries. So our data can be sort of used in that kind of space, Ace, um, but it's also used by businesses themselves in terms of designing and, and looking at um, what kind of services might be profitable or commercially viable in different locations. So I'd be sort of looking at that as well. But the the question went to the fact that it was a bit of a unique point in time. So I think when policymakers or um, academics or to private businesses are using that data, they'll, they'll look at the data points from 2016 and 2011 too, and they'll look at different areas around the country to try and work out whether or not um, they should be investing, say, in, in takeaway food industry as one which has grown here. Do they think that's going to be sustained and stay in that position by looking across the country? Or do they think actually, I know it only really featured in these areas and maybe that was a lockdown effect and we probably need another data point in order to, to try and understand and make those, those choices as we go forward. Um, yeah, that's probably the key thing I'll add on that. Great. Well, we have time for one more question, and I'd like to open it up to the uh, full panel here today. What was the most surprising COVID data insight? Uh, we'll start with you, Caroline. I knew you were going to throw to me, Nicole. Well, I, sh I, I said it. I probably should try and come up with something new, but I was very surprised about the number of people who did did drive to work. I think um, living in Brisbane, it seemed to me that the the roads were very, very empty. And um, I, not, I think it was at that time that Brisbane City Council was still offering free parking within the, the city area for people to, to come in. So I think that was a, an interesting observation that a lot of people were still driving to work. And what we could do with that data is actually analyse it again at a more granular level to see where those patterns are. And it might be that people are driving cars into areas where they, they're not as well serviced by, by public transport. But yeah, I thought the, the 6.4 million vehicles still on the road on census day in the midst of a pandemic really surprised me. And Duncan, your most surprising COVID data insight. I think I might follow on on that same theme. I think um, what the COVID period of time has really put into, made me realise looking at the census data is that the, the growth that we see over a five-year period of time, so to 8.6% growth from the last five years in Australia, like it is so significant to our numbers. But, yeah, when we look at the counts, when we look at, um, yeah, 
oh, the proportion of people driving has dropped, but the actual number of people driving is nearly the same or has risen in some areas. And so, oh, and that also comes into play when um, those it was probably one of my favourite charts in my presentation today it was Mark's one of a number of international arrivals from 2016 to 2021. And we all knew that it sort of had fallen off a bit of a cliff in, in 2020 and 2021. But the fact that a million people had moved to Australia in the last five years and that Australia had become much more uh, culturally diverse in the last five years was, uh, yeah, a bit of a surprise. So it's sort of, in some ways, the surprise for me was actually how little COVID had, has affected some of these long-term kind of patterns and trends and the fact that actually for a lot of these kind of increases that we see in a lot of areas of Australia, it's a growing country and we see increases, it's more of a bit of a flat patch when it is a turning backwards of kind of trends and change. And Mark? Yeah, uh, right up until Duncan's finish answer of Duncan's question, I thought mine was still going to be live, but uh, <laughs> you basically said uh, at the end there what I was going to say, but I'll, I'll cast it a bit different and then um, note something else, I guess, which is um, that it, for me, it was how much of life got on as usual, even though the experience of living through COVID was so different. Uh, and I live in Sydney. And as we saw in a lot of those charts, Sydney was very affected around that particular time. We've all had that experience over the course of COVID, but at, in, in August 2021, uh, Sydney and New South Wales were um, experiencing lockdowns and, and things at that time. So it felt like life was very, very different. But you do look at, um, you know, even though uh, some some of those uh, graphs and you know, the bars have halved and that since what we saw five years ago, there's still, you know, half of that uh, still getting on with life as usual in those circumstances. And so that that's um that's where I was surprised. Uh, and it and includes cars on the road. It includes uh, people who were, um you know, traveling to like going to work in general when it felt like everybody was working from home at the time, those sorts of things that uh, that did come across as a surprise to me. Uh, the the thing that I guess uh, I hadn't appreciated or, or thought about and COVID really, really showed was how different the city experience was to the regional experience and the um, and the and the different occupations and things. It does make sense. It shouldn't be a surprise in some ways, but looking at that, thinking about the experience of, you know, um, whether it's one in four people working from home in a capital city versus one in eight or something in, in regional areas, those sorts of differences uh, really, really stark and really showed up in the data, in particular in one of those um, slides that Caroline showed, but um, but yeah, there's a, across a, a range of variables we could, we could see that difference in in that, and across states as well, which is which is a more obvious part of COVID, but really does show up a lot in the data. So that that's probably the thing that I found most interesting, whether it's surprising or not, yeah, it's certainly interesting. Lovely. Um, a big thank you to our panel today, Caroline Deans, Duncan Young, and Mark Harding. Um, if your question wasn't answered during today's session, you can email client.services at abs.gov.au um, or visit the ABS website and explore the data from the second release of 2021 census data. Um, a recording of today's session will be made available in the coming days on the ABS website and the ABS YouTube channel.